<sighs> Every drop of water you drink, it's ocean day. It is. Wherever you are. Wherever you are. So today we're going to talk about why the oceans matter. It seems like it's a really timely um, topic. Stay in here. <laughs> <laughs> the virtual background is uh, interesting as well. But we have this beautiful reef. We wanted to share what a, really what a healthy reef should look like. Right. And um, really try to give people inspiration and, and uh, ways that they can help to ensure that reefs that are in good shape stay that way and reefs that are really in need of some help um, give you some you know, ways that can help to restore the oceans every day. So healthy ocean means healthy people. We're in the midst of <laughs> oh, sort of a, a global issue about human health. And mm -hmm. I think one of the great things that has come out of this is a renewed awareness. We should have known all along, but not everybody kind of gets it that we're dependent on a healthy planet. And when the animals are in trouble, when the forests are in trouble, when the ocean is in trouble, we're in trouble. And we have a real message, a wake up call. And it's one thing that pulls us all together. It really is. I mean, our, our personal health and planetary health, especially ocean health, is just you know, locked together in, yep. in ways that, um, you know, we're really only beginning to understand some of them. Well, it, it started significantly about 50 years ago, 51 years ago. Could we get that picture of Earth? <laughs> the, the most important picture, perhaps, that was ever taken. It's us from up there high in the sky. And it was the young, then young astronaut, William Anders, who looked out of the window of Apollo 8 spacecraft. And he and his colleagues, his fellow astronauts, had a mission. They were supposed to go look at the far side of the moon. And they said, what they discovered was this. It was Earth. It was us in this amazing universe where only this blue miracle exists. It's where we exist. Mm -hmm. So 50 years ago, it was 1969, and 68 in December that that picture was taken. And since then, what's happened? We've learned why the blue part of the planet really is so important, which is why we want to share with you. We can take the picture off and get back to <laughs> looking at your smiley face. <laughs> Mine too. Exactly. But it is, I mean, it's that real iconic um, image that, you know, all humanity before us never had an opportunity to that's see it, it from this. We're all there. That's, all, that's home. That's our spacecraft. Yeah. And Kids the, get it. Yeah. And you, you know, it's, it's, we see this, it's so called the blue marble, right? Yeah. Right. It's <laughs> home. Home. It's so fragile. Well, it's vulnerable. I mean, Earth will go on with us or without us. It was without us for most of the history of Earth, four and a half billion years. But the thing is, since that photograph was taken, we have learned more about the ocean, about ourselves, where we have come from, where we might be going than during all preceding history. And it's partly because of the kinds of technology that took us high in the sky, that enabled us to communicate in ways that our predecessors could not. Can we go back to us? Sure. See us? Here we are. <laughs> so, are we? We're, we're looking at... Yeah, we're... It's are we on the full screen? We're there. All right. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm going to check our time here too right now. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we think about all the things that are going into the ocean and how they're coming back to us at this point. It used to be that, you know, the ocean could endure some fishing. It could endure some... Um, addition of, you know, our waste stream and this sort of thing. But as our numbers have grown and our our coast, our population wants to kind of live close to the coast, um, I mean, it's more than 50% live within 50 miles of the coast. And it's, um, the impacts are enormous. But no matter where we live, uh, we touch the ocean and the ocean touches us. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So you went out on a beach cleanup over the weekend. I did. I went out recently, um, went out along Ocean Beach here along San Francisco. And it was a, a very blustery day. I mean, there weren't too many people out there, but in less than an 
you know, you, you got a bucket hour, for us. hour and a half. Your, I want to see your bucket. I uh, collected. I can't bring the whole bucket into the screen. Without. Well, you can bring it up between us. <laughs> you can. Yeah. Here we go. But, oh my this gosh. is just one bucket. I mean, there. Uh, you can't see, you it, see it there. <laughs> you can't see it. It's gonna go away. Oh. <laughs> anyway, it's a bucket. It's a bucket. There it is. It's a blue bucket. <laughs> um, but the most ironic and iconic object that we found on the beach. Oh, beach. <laughs> here she is, beach Barbie. <laughs> and it's the saddest thing. It was just laying there abandoned in the sand and it's a little swimsuit with a sea star on it. And we, we really think about, um, you know, what's happened to sea stars recently. And again, wondering, you know, the sea star wasting and the impacts that it's had. Uh, oh. the, it's not just that the sea stars are, you know, had a, a really um, traumatic event, but it's that compounding, um, the domino effect that it then allowed the urchin population, the sea stars are the primary predator of the urchin, so it allowed their numbers to fall. And then suddenly the urchins were eating more than their fair share of the kelp and the <laughs> kelp forests were feeling the, the crunch and we mm -hmm. just, and it's just this sort of complex Everything thing. connects. It, and, Everything or disconnects. Connects. Yeah. And, and so these are the small things, you know, we don't really think about uh, one little thing like, uh, you know, sea urchins are wasting, but that compounds and comes back to loss of habitat for many other species. And um, it's just a, just a not, not a healthy situation. But the good thing, the really good thing is we know what we couldn't know before. Let me say we've learned more about the ocean and why it matters since that first view of ourselves, Earth, from space than during all preceding history. You know, policies were made, uh, laws were made. We thought that Earth was too big to fail and then suddenly we're, we're beginning to understand and see that what we're doing is affecting the nature of nature. It's affecting uh, not just creatures in the sea, it, it's coming back to haunt us. It as really well. does come back to haunt us. Um, you know, another thing I saw just this week that I found this sort of mind blowing is that there's been a, a new um, certification by Walmart of tuna as being a sustainable. What? <laughs> A sustainable fishery. No and, way. How could that be? And you know, it prompted me to to sort of look at this. This is not a tuna. But that's what a lot of people think of it. <laughs> this is not a tuna. Um, and it just. Oh. I mean, if people knew how incredible the ocean wildlife. Oh man. Really is, and you know, engineers. You know, in 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 my work looking at the building and design of underwater vehicles. Oftentimes we'll find ourselves talking about the virtues of a tuna and how they move through the water, the, the propulsion they have, the ability to travel at more than 50 miles an hour. For yeah, engineers sigh with envy when they see what tuna, tuna can do naturally. And looking at the, the fluid dynamics of, the, of the, the, the body form and, and trying to figure out how could we build something that perfect. You know, it's a terrible thought, but... Huh. Can sinks. <laughs> <laughs> right. no, the, this is not hydrodynamic. <laughs> no, it's true. But so much of what is put in cans that comes from the sea is fed to animals, to, to chickens, to cows, to pigs, to cats, to dogs. I mean, it, it's a terrible thought to think that we would can cats and dogs to feed to tuna. <laughs> but, true enough but, but you know it's animals to animals but you uh, know, one of the one of the really um i think one of the important things that came out this week was the ocean elders um one thing campaign yeah as well and that's one of the one things that we talked about is that um the choices that you make in in what you're feeding to your pets you know you're, and what you're feeding to yourself and to yourself yeah. you know, and so really looking to figure out best choices that you can make it's making a difference when you think only 50 years ago, the populations of bluefin tuna and other tunas was as at a significantly higher level. They're down by as much as 90% in a few decades because of our appetite for ocean wildlife. Now, some people need to eat wildlife, whether it's from the land or from the sea, but most people do not. It's usually it's a, a choice. It's a choice. Mm -hmm. 
So if you have a choice, <laughs> why not let the ocean have the fish? If you have a choice, and most people do. People in Chicago don't need to eat tuna, and neither do we here in California. No. <laughs> uh, but there are some places where it's a primary source of sustenance, but that's a relatively small number of people. We used to feed all of ourselves largely from wild plants and wild animals, but that was thousands of years ago. And there were many more, many fewer of us. And lots more wild. Yeah. So 2020, it's a turning point, and we do have choices. I, I, thinking about the kids who should be having graduation ceremonies right now, celebrating a turning point for them at this turning point for choices we're making about the ocean, about what we're allowing to go in, what we're allowing to, to take out. But the kids face the best chance that any of us will ever have for going from where we are to get to a better place because they have the superpower of knowing what could not be known when I was a kid. So I want to salute all of you at whatever level you are. There's one young woman in particular. Oh yeah, Dawn, she, uh, she sent us, her dad sent us <laughs> uh, some pictures of her. She was, she was actually um, dressed as you for, for a school. I want to dress up as Dawn. Yeah, <laughs> for a school project. And, and she was um, out there, you know, talking about why the oceans matter. And it was great, it was great to see, see her. She's just graduated from um, elementary school school so she'll be Why? Oh, facing good. the the uh, middle school in some form or another that's it's scary a, it's oh that's scary not thought. it's really it's yeah. a great opportunity because mm -hmm. you know and i was i remember when i was in the fifth grade being so wise thinking wow i know so much more now than i did a year ago <laughs> and it, it's, it just never stops no never you can stop, never stop learning what i know this year that i didn't know last year this is the greatest era of discovery ever, and it just gets better. We now have not just the problems associated with 8 billion people, we've got 8 billion minds connected, and I'm so glad for the fresh, well-informed young minds coming along. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make their future at least as good as the time I've had when I was starting out. It's there, we can do this. We really can, and I mean, even with this, the whole shelter in place and more people working from home, we've seen how that collective effort to you know, flatten the curve has also helped wildlife to recover in a lot yes. of areas. Isn't it's helped exciting? our air quality, water quality. Mm. I mean, it can happen, it can be done, but we've got to really, as a group, you know, kind of look at how our, actions, our individual actions, our, our one things, our choices that we make every day combined can have a very significant impact and start to turn things around. So yeah, from, from you know, plummeting this down. I mean, I this. like down. I yeah. like going down. I like going really down <laughs> right, deep. But, <laughs> but the decline of the natural systems is something we can do something about. Yeah. We just have to do it. Yeah, we really do. So, um, so maybe we should hear some ideas Questions well, we've got a few questions. Um, oh, really? We do. <laughs> so, um, do you think that it's wrong or uh, to eat wild smoked salmon purchased from a grocer who's a member of the Marine Stewardship Council? Well, I love the concept of the Marine Stewardship Council, and I was one of the champions in the early days. I've been concerned in recent times that the decisions are, are not always as well-grounded as they should be. It pains me to see Patagonian toothfish, otherwise known as Chilean sea bass for sale in Whole Foods. I mean, come on, there's, there's no sustainable take of creature that's never been on our menu ever until recent years. They take a long time to grow and huh, their, their place in the ocean is far more important than a place on our plates. And that's true of most ocean wildlife. We, we should make, use, exercise our power of choice. If you have a choice, just let ocean life stay in the ocean. And don't think of every 
living thing in the ocean is seafood. Think of it first and foremost as wildlife, as sea life. Sea life. And, you know, particularly, I think, with, with salmon, um, it's, it's one of these animals that is not only very reliant on a healthy ocean, but also on a healthy forest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the connections. The connections. They, mm -hmm. These animals, you know, they, they transit from freshwater to seawater and then spend a good portion of their life at sea, and then they return to the stream in which they were hatched, <laughs> uh, which is a miraculous, <laughs> a miraculous thing. But so many other animals depend on them for food. So oftentimes we'll see, uh, you know, fishermen will be upset that, you know, the sea lions or the bears yeah. or the eagles are taking their salmon. <laughs> well, who got there <laughs> first? Who was there first? And, <laughs> not, and Not people. So, but unless we really uh, get after protecting forests, the, the rivers, the streams, the tributaries that go all the way back to the landlocked states, looking where those, where the headwaters of these systems are and protect it all the way along, right. there won't be salmon for anyone. And now we've got the, the you know, the pebble mine oh, um, in Alaska is, is inching its way towards uh, <laughs> being approved, being yeah. approved, which yeah. is, is disastrous, a, disastrous and, for salmon. And I think it's also important to respect the people who've been in the area where salmon live. It's one thing for their cultural heritage, for their sustenance, but we don't have to eat salmon far from where salmon live. And I mean, it's respecting them. I, I have some recipe books from a <laughs> from hundred years ago. And you know, there are birds, wild birds in the, in the recipe books. It was okay to kill wildlife to eat when our numbers were smaller, at least we thought it was, but we managed to exterminate some of the wild birds because of our appetite for them. We're doing the same thing for the ocean. But we just need to think differently, respect those who have few choices. But for most of us, what are we thinking? We don't need four and 20 blackbirds baked into a pie. <laughs> no, we do not. <laughs> Let's but, go to another question. Okay. So Candace is asking, she's saying that she's a, a vegan and, and owns a cat, um, or a cat owns her perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> but um, she said she's feeding the cat fancy feast, the McDonald's of cat food. Mm -hmm. And um, she says, but she has no idea what to feed her that would keep her healthy, um, or what's really an ethical choice. But I mean, it's tough with cats because they are carnivores. Carnivores, mm -hmm. that, and you know, there's really no way around feeding them, um, you know, meat. Meat. They have to have a meat protein diet. But you diet. can make better choices. Absolutely. Again, low on the food chain, something that reproduces rapidly. Now, I don't there are some real problems with chicken <laughs> farms. There are. Well, they the, feed a lot of wild fish to chickens. Right, and they. Chickens are not treated as living creatures, they're treated as products. Yeah. But it's a better choice than tuna. Yeah. Better choice than salmon. Better yeah. choice than any wild animal. And, and there are some people that are, you know, that have the byproducts of, um, you know, rabbit or turkey or um, mm -hmm. things like that. People actually cooking for their cats, if you will. Mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, cats by their nature would eat more of a like you say, animals that are low on the food chain. Right. You know, they eat birds, they eat rodents. <laughs> <laughs> we don't see fancy feast mouse recipe, but <laughs> we had a we had a cat once. His name was Miao Tse Tung. Yes. Yeah. Miao Tse Tung stole the whole turkey off. We were having a turkey for, for Thanksgiving, I guess, an occasional event. He stole the whole thing. He did. He dragged it away. It was <laughs> shocking. So, <laughs> so sympathize. We do sympathize. And, and I think the best thing is just to, you know, do try to make the best choices that are available and, and definitely stay away from the ocean wildlife based yeah. uh, flavors. I don't think we're ever going to see a cat that's going to, you know, drag down and uh, subdue a tuna or <laughs> it's not flounder. Normal. It's or, not their natural diet. You know, or shrimp, you know. <laughs> it's not really natural for them. So We have another question somewhere. Yeah. Um, so again, coming back to seafood, is it, uh, an anonymous is asking, is it uh, <laughs> better to eat local, um, keeping the ecosystem in mind? You know, how, how could you? Well, uh, there's lots of reasons for doing your best to eat whatever it is locally have a garden in your backyard. It's a great idea. Yeah. We have a little one. Um, I have friends who have substantial ones. I grew up with a garden, always. During World War II, 
everyone had a victory garden in their backyard. Even if you just had a little, you know, like a flower pots filled with, with, with vegetables, uh, easy to grow things. Tomatoes, we, strawberries, something, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, but the idea, of it, there are two things. I mean, I love the international connections and in, in showing how we are together in so many things. But to the extent that we can lower the carbon footprint from transport, it, that's a positive thing. If we know where our food comes from, that's a positive thing. Um, if you just think about what you're eating, you want to know where it came from, what the, what the trajectory has been. It's become really complicated. It's hard to figure out where the ingredients are for that which keeps us in groceries. But we can do our best, and we can shorten the, the chain as much as possible. And eating plants, of course, it's always been the case that, and it still is, even in this, this meat-centric <laughs> culture that we live in, that still the largest number of calories come from plants. Yeah. And, and more should, you know, we... we and, and, you know, it's not, it's not like you're, you know, telling everyone in the world that they need to become vegan. Um, even if people just flex a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, just flex a little bit, try a couple of plant-based dishes each week, you know, cut it back to, you know, a meat, low on the food chain meat. Um, once in a while. Once in a while. Or maybe every day, but. Every, every day, but just, but just cutting back on it can make such an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. And again, eating locally, buying from a local farmer. Um, farmer's markets. Farmer's markets, raising your own backyard chickens. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> For eggs. For eggs. I mean, there's so many small things that are achievable. If you and magnify it times 8 billion, think of the impact. And Or even by your own community, even your own family. Right. I mean, we talk yeah. about food security, but food security really starts in your own community. If, yeah. if Your own kitchen. Your own kitchen. And if you're working with your own neighborhood, you know, maybe you're great at growing tomatoes, but you suck at growing corn. <laughs> But your neighbor down the street has like an amazing, he's torn out the lawn and now they've got a great corn field up there. You know, trade back and forth, work with your local, you know, mm -hmm. food pantry or, or gleaning groups that, that come around and take your extra produce and can give it back to the community that is, mm -hmm. is uh, facing a food desert situation. It's how you can yeah. um, be able to help, uh, you know, across all socioeconomic groups. Oh, absolutely. Is by community uh, farms. Community farms yeah. and giving back to the community. I mean, every school and every church ought to have a garden going where- well, the White House had a garden for a while. Had being the key I word. I said had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, don't be afraid to tear out that lawn. No. Oh, Please. You, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Good health got, really has a fundamental basis in good food. We've got a couple more questions here that we can pop in before Do you we want some run live out of ones? time. We can, we have a, a chance to Do we to have get, live questions? I don't know if we've got some here. We can ask to have some live questions. If there are some live questions, we could take those. But we have the, just a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. Hi, hi everyone. Yes, so we do have some live questions coming in, but I thought it might be instructive to just let people know how you do this. So if you mm -hmm. want to ask a direct question of Sylvia and Liz, you do this by clicking on the raise your hand icon. That is in the middle of the bar at the bottom of your screen. And I see they're filling up now. And April has been there for a while. So April, if you unmute yourself, you can ask a question live to them. Okay, thank you so much. Um, quite an honor to actually speak with you all today. <laughs> I met you last year, Sylvia, in May in Portland, Oregon, and oh. you're, you're just amazing. Um, uh, but my question is, um, I live in North Texas, which is inland, so about four hours from the coast. Um, and I've always wanted to move closer to the coast. And I know you, you all spoke about how 50% of, you know, America lives, you know, along the coastline. Is it better if I stay inland or, or sh should I go ahead and move towards the coast if I want to? <laughs> oh, follow your heart wherever you live and, and really understand what you can do to inspire care in others. That's the key. You, you, if you get it and are, understand, it's a, it's a gift back to the world for you to enlighten others in a, in a very positive way. People ask me, what can I do to make a difference for the ocean? I say, 
take a child out to the beach or to wherever. And if you can, go get them wet. No child left dry is my motto. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. But if you don't have a child of your own, borrow one. Because okay. <laughs> seeing the world through their eyes and listening to their hopes for the future, I mean, how can you let them down? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say if you have the choice to go live near the sea, by all means, let it let it be so. But obviously with respect. And get that so get those kids out there. Yeah. Go do and your yourself. own beach cleanup. I want to see if you find a Barbie too. <laughs> yeah. I actually did a beach cleanup last June and I found some some little kid sandals. It was so sad, but yeah, oh, it's just it's crazy. You found yeah. some high heeled shoes. Yeah, I found some high heels. It was kind oh of my, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of bad. <laughs> At least they were out there and they took their shoes off. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate y'all. Oh, thank you. We have maybe time for one more question. Sure, I think Ray's had his hand up for a while. We'll see if Ray, if you want to unmute right. yourself, you can talk directly to them. Thank you so much. Good to see you all. Hey, Ray. And you. I hear your voice. Uh, well, thank You're you. You're a champion. <laughs> Thanks. Um, um, so happy to, you know, watch you guys yesterday as well and, and hearing about the law and uh, the reforms that were made around the tri the triangle, the coral triangle. I'm asking how can we effectively educate the policymakers here and the corporate leaders, especially because they're so powerful in Florida, which is largely dependent on tourism, to help create more sustainable laws pertaining to marine protected areas. And I mean, it, social media is great. All the things that all the people we know are wonderful, but in terms of action, we need powerful tools to help motivate our government. And do you, do you have... Uh, any records that we could copy and duplicate from certain areas of the world that might be implementable in the United States? Because it seems to be a real uphill battle here. That's well, go to the Mission Blue website, I suggest. Uh, just, just this week, we have been able to open uh, and show our partnership with Esri, the global information systems company that's been around now for 50 years working with Mission Blue with 120 plus hope spots, including the Florida Gulf Coast where you are, that you have data, share stories, success stories, problems, and to characterize each of these places with a network of hope. You're a part of it already. And I think we should mobilize kid power. Yes. It's hard to resist a child yeah, who says, you know, please, Mr. Senator, please, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, or well, Madam Mayor. And I think it, a lot of it too is is really kind of you know becoming more involved in the local politics, starting yeah. right in your own in your own townships. And if you go to a city council meeting and you and you see that all the city council members are sitting around there on the Diaz and they've got plastic water bottles, <laughs> you know, don't be Call afraid. Out. Don't be afraid to take them. Uh, sure, where you can see it. We can see it here somewhere. Yeah, of course. I'm I'll disappearing in front of the camera. Yeah, you know, take them a, the reusable bottles. You know, just do things like that within your there own community. <laughs> yeah, but, you like uh, this one. It looks like a scuba oh, tank. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Um, but uh, 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 you know, contribution to buy them all. Yeah. Bottles. Right, and so then yeah. maybe you go to a local Get business the kids to deliver them. Right, a local small business, and say, "Hey, we want to sponsor reusable bottles for." Uh, you know, the city council members to, to use and, and have the kids deliver them. So it's, <laughs> it's a sort of little nudges that, that build up into bigger pushes for change. Yeah, it's very good. Thanks. Starts somewhere. Yeah. Always. Cheers. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Why don't we just take two more that have hands have been up for a while. And first, okay. let's just go to Christina. Christina, if you unmute yourself, you can talk directly. Okay, uh, I don't know if my English is We're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Can you say that again or else we'll consider it a bad connection? I think that connection is not going to work for us and we'll just, right. maybe what we'll do is we'll just move to Michael and see if he has a better one that we can just take his question. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, so, hi. 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 I'm Donna Kiggy, you said, you talked about. What was I, the question? 
My name is Donna, and my question is, um, what's the most thing that's impacting the ocean? Like, is it the um, pollution or overeating fish? Well, it's unfortunately, it's really kind of a the situation of many small impacts. It's what they you know they call the death of a thousand cuts. <laughs> It's bites, kind of morbid death bites, of a thousand bites, but it's um, or but bits it's of, or bits bits of traffic, traffic. yeah, bits <laughs> trash, it's, plastic. It's many many small things that we that are have a cumulative effect uh, that and in reverse and in reverse, yeah. It's so, small things that will add up. Small to things turn add things up. around, right? But but it is it is that combination of of um, you know plastics, uh, the waste stream going in from from uh, you know agricultural. The big agriculture and um, lawns, lawns, <laughs> uh, overwhelmed sewage treatment plants. Again, things like this that that um, we could get away with it when there were fewer of us, but with so many uh, people in such large scale farming going on, especially mm -hmm. monocultural farming, we really are seeing these enormous impacts. But I think probably the single most terrible thing is ignorance or lack of True or complacency. You think that it's either the problem is so big, there's nothing I can do, or the problem, what problem? I mean, we can still breathe. Why should I care? Uh, those two things, either you don't know or you don't care, is, <laughs> those are broad things, but. But they're uh, deadly. But that's, that's yeah. really, because it keeps us from addressing each of these solutions, such as what we take out of the ocean and what we put into the ocean, how much of the ocean, how much of the land, how much of nature that we can embrace with care. You know, it makes a difference what you do if you have a backyard to treat that as a part of the solution for taking care of the ocean. Um, places that have a lot of pesticides and herbicides to keep a lawn, to keep a, a place look, looking, the way it, <laughs> we have come to think of is beautiful. Rethink what's beautiful. Beautiful might be wildflowers. Beautiful might be a row of tomatoes that are are treated with respect. And, you know, we need to rethink how our relationship with nature. And you can do it on an individual level, starting with you. If you don't have a backyard, you can still have a community where you think, how can we do things better? How can we treat nature with greater respect? Because it'll come back to your own health. And it comes back, and, it, and all those things benefit the ocean. Everything yeah, flows do. to the sea. Yeah, so that's right. um, anything, even if- you, Good and bad. Yeah, no matter where you live, you can have a Im positive impact on the ocean. You have one more? Do we still have time? Yeah, we, we do. Well, um, let's try Melody. And we'll make that the last one. Go ahead, Melody. Can you unmute yourself? Hi, Sylvia. So um, I met you at the Aquarium of the Pacific, and I took a picture with you, and you're my mentor. <laughs> so what has kept motivating you to keep going while, while this is the pandemic? And like a, a lot of stuff has been happening. And I went to go beach cleaning up, too, and like Liz. And I found so many, so much trash three bags of full trash with wine oh. bottles, gl wine glass bottles, three bags of them, and I threw them away and kept trying. But, like, I'm 11 years old. Should I, like, should we, should my family and I keep going and trying our best to keep saving the uh, ocean? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's, it makes a difference. It, it truly does. You should never think that you're without power. I really believe that the 11 year olds, you very much included, have so much that I did not have when I was 11 years old. You know that the, there are limits to what we can put into the ocean or take out of the ocean. And you have the power of influencing others and the power of choice now that you know. Uh, ignorance is a terrible thing, <laughs> but we don't, we're not, we, now we know, we know what to do. We need to do what you're doing. Get out there and use your power and right. tell the world. 
So. Yeah, especially, you know, sharing your story about picking up all those yeah. wine bottles. And, <laughs> you know, maybe go back, if you, if you remember, if you took any pictures, go back to that, where those wine bottles came from. You know, yeah, the return winery. to sender. Return to sender, say, hey, whatever mm. winery it happened to be. Yeah, you know, dude. I just picked up three bags of your bottles on the beach. What, what the What's heck, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe they'll help sponsor the next beach cleanup and, or, or take oh. it on as a, as a campaign to kind of help make sure that their, their waste products are, um, have an end of life that's responsible. So what gives me cause for hope? Why do I keep, <laughs> keep on keeping on? Well, I'm looking at one of them right here, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also looking at you and knowing that things are turning in a positive direction. We, we need to do a lot more, but that's exciting. You know, if you ch could choose to be 11 years old anywhere in time, I would choose right now because you can literally make history. This is a moment when what we do or what we fail to do will have a magnified impact on everything that follows. You're armed with knowledge. You're armed with power. And just get out there and use it. And I really look forward to our next engagement. It won't be, you know, another couple of weeks. I hope you'll come back and tell your friends. We'll take on a new topic and dive in. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank, Thank you. you. She's Thank crying. you. Oh, <laughs> that's salt water used in a good way. It's all good. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Did you want to take just one more to end it? Because Antonia is there and you can take the question from Antonia and then you can wrap it up. Okay. Go ahead, Antonia. Go ahead, Antonia. You can talk if you'd like to. Hello. 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 My name is Antonia. I'm a 15 year old and I'm aspiring to be a marine biologist when I grow up. Yeah. So you both have really affected me, your work as well. My question was, um, my question was, what was the most beautiful, it's a pretty simple question, but I want to know what was the most beautiful thing you have experienced under the water? Oh, wow. I, th I, th I, think, I think it could be the, the expression on my grandson's face when they saw the ocean for the first time. Well, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm kind of thinking back to the, to the experience we had in Hawaii with the uh, bioluminescent coral. Oh, right. Right. You know, yeah. you know, when, when was it? You went with the gym suit. That right? was 1979 before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> and in the gym suit, is, it's kind of like a, a hard, it looks like the Michelin man suit or a space suit, but it's made of a, of a metal. metal mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it protects from the pressure. But you went and walked on the seafloor in um, 1979. And yeah. you approached these large um, bamboo coral. They look like big spirally whiskers that just kind of stand there on the sea, seabed. And they're, you, they're, they, they're deep. deep it's water. where it's dark all the time. So about uh, 400 meters? Yeah, 400 yeah. meters. Yeah. So and you walk up, she walked up and touched it naturally, curiosity. <laughs> and the unexpected thing happened to these big pulsing blue rings of light all the way up, all the way down, all the way up, all the way down. Yeah. But no way to capture that image. Um, she could only come back and tell the story of seeing yeah. it. And then for years, people tried to go down with the usually with the, the Pisces submersibles and study these, these deep coral beds. But then just a couple of years ago, it's 2018, mm -hmm. we went back and we took a deep water camera, uh, 4 million ISO for <laughs> camera buffs. <laughs> New technology. New technology. Gives to, us the power. And um, grandsons are able to go down yeah. with us in the submersible and record for the first time the uh, bioluminescent behavior of these of these deep sea to corals. be able to share it with and others. to be able to share it with the yeah. world but it was just it was so beautiful to see just that that neon blue mm -hmm. light coming and um, and again the expression on the faces of taylor and morgan mm -hmm. and we had some other kids yeah other had, kids with us yeah had had uh, taken to share the view and that's it no child Left. left dry, except they were dry in a submarine. Yeah, but that, <laughs> <laughs> semantics. Go deep, yeah. go deep. Go, go deep. But yeah, the, it, every dive has something just yeah. incredibly beautiful. It's life in the ocean. Yeah. So, it's a living ocean. 
everybody out there, go, go get a face mask and, and get out there. It is socially distant. You can do this. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to stay socially distant from the fish. That's true. Yeah. Except on your Thank plate. You. <laughs> that was quite, that, that must have been quite of an experience. Thank you. Oh, I hope you get to do it. Yeah. It's there to be done. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so yeah, I think, you know, we're, we've kind of run out of time today, but um, we will be back every couple of weeks and I encourage you guys to send in questions, um, yeah, get your friends to join in because we, we'd love to get more questions and if you have other topics you'd like us to talk about. And whether you're too. 11 years old or 15 years old or any age, we, we want your input. Yeah, and I'm, I'm and really, I, I really want to hear stories about what, <laughs> what one thing's uh, people pick to do oh, yeah. and how they carry them out. I think it's just a great campaign and mm -hmm. I'm really eager to see how people are going to, especially all you kids, how you're going to make a difference. Make a difference. <laughs> yep. So we'll it, look forward to seeing you next time. You know our motto, onward. And downward. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <sighs>